He sent me the video and I replied rather wittily, uh, I see ripping off T-Rex is genetic. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, a question. One of yours or one of the of the righteous listeners? Let's do a righteous listener. This is Michael. All right, Noel. I want to know what's the weirdest thing you received from a fan. The weirdest thing. Japanese fans buy you weird things. But, like, they buy you stuff that you initially go, why don't they buy me stuff like that? And then you end up keeping it because that's the kind of practical. What, like? Stuff for the house. Like mad what, soft furnishings. I've had cushions and and uh, uh, yeah, e- utensils for the kitchen. Yeah, That's a strange ashtray. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Can. Yeah, but they did. They put. They they quite. They can be quite thoughtful. Mm. And uh, I've ended up bringing loads of it home. Yeah, really. Yeah. How much goes in the bin? No, not well. If I if I well. In the in the bin in the hotel, I'd say a good seventy percent of it. But, <laughs> but there's the but there's the thirty percent of it that makes it home. And yeah, somebody somebody bought me a set of cushions once <laughs> with uh, that had fit that uh, a picture of all my family on them. So me, Sarah, and, and all the kids, and I brought them home. Um, so my problem with receiving gifts, right, is the face. You know, they're like when you open it. I find that quite nerve wracking. No, fans don't expect you to open it in front of them because there's a melee and ah right, so they just hand them over. Yeah, there's hand them over to you. Yeah, quibble back to your hotel room. Go. There's a lot of uh, a lot of snacks from Japanese kids, like crisps and chocolate, and uh, and then clothes. I actually got some cool T-shirts last time I was in Japan. Is that like a different in the culture of like meeting your rock star hero? Well, that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah, if I if I I've been in Japan and South Korea a couple of times on my birthday, and honestly, the last time I got it was in Seoul. The amount of stuff that was in the dressing room was unbelievable. I mean, it was like a generation game. Right. There was, I mean, and tons of like, I mean, there's a lot of Man City stuff and Beatles memorabilia, blah blah blah. But then there's always the odd thing that's like, actually. <laughs> going to give that to Sarah for Christmas. A really good cheese grater. <laughs> <laughs> it's a can of mace. That'll, yeah, but it's quite risky, isn't it? It's quite, I mean, you're taking stuff from a load of random people and then putting it backstage, and some of them are snacks. I'd worry that someone might have put some Yeah, well, that, well, that's, that, 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 well that's you all over, isn't it? Yeah. It's just a nervous little, oh, what if somebody's poisoned them? <laughs> Why would a Jap- why would a, why would a Korean fan poison their idol? Well, they wouldn't be a fan, would they? They might be some sort of like political extremist who's got a yeah. You've not been to South Korea, have you? There's no there's no one extreme in South Korea. That's the other mob across the border. I can't believe you've done gigs there in North Korea. In the north. In the north, yeah. No, I'd like to go to North Korea, though. I'd love to go. No. Well, you're not allowed to go and just experience I'd like the... to look at it from a helicopter. Because I, but... cause D- Damon Auburn was telling... Damon's been as, a, as a tourist. Korea. Yeah, and he was, tell- he, was, he was telling me the stories of it. Yeah. Sounds like it's real, I mean, fascinating. They sa- it's, he was saying, obviously, you can't leave the hotel without somebody with you. And so whoever you... You all like get on a bus and there's like this... There's, uh, you take him to see the shops right and uh he's always said there's this sense that as they see the bus pulling up everybody starts to go into work mode and then mm. as the bus pulls off they're kind of like you know it's a bit of a facade what was he doing it. like he's just literally I think he just went as a tourist just to see yeah yeah i'd like I, I, yeah he was saying to me do you want you fancy going i was like what me and you going south what north korea <laughs> that would be a crazy yeah. documentary I need to write an opera on the plane on the way, wouldn't he? While well, I'd be getting rat arsed on, <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the lager. Um, I'd love to go though. I'd love to. Exp- I'd love to experience the atmosphere of it. What about um, when Dennis Rodman, the uh, basketball player, he was friends with? Yeah, the other fella. What's his name? The, the, the new one, Kim Jong Un. Kim Jong Un. Un, Un, the new one. Yeah, he. Um, yeah, he was like friends with him, wasn't he? And so, like, the American government were almost trying to get messages through Dennis Rodman to him. 
Imagine he was like an Oasis fan and he mm. invited you over Probably there. Probably he's, he undoubtedly is. Yeah. What if he invited you over there and was like... So Ooh, you, Kim Jong-un? Yeah. I'd go. Absolutely. Would you? Yeah. Why not? I'd go and come back and obviously you'd be met by MI5 at the airport and I'd spin him a right load of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, mate, they're so advanced, it's unbelievable. We've got these rockets. <laughs> can be in London in half an hour. Yeah, spin them a right yarn. But um, what is interesting about that part of the world is the South Koreans, right, they're like... They're like the Irish of Southeast Asia. Right. They're real up for it, fun loving, amazing fans, great gigs and all that. Which means that the other lot of the border must have that in their soul, but they're kind of repressed and downtrodden. Yeah. That's why it's heartbreaking. Kind of in, indoctrinated with like nonsense communism. Um which kind of makes it a little bit more sad really. But um yeah, I'd go. Would you not go if you were offered to go? No, because I feel like... I mean, you're too scared, though, anyway. Yeah, I'd, like, be, I'd just be scared oh, that it was yeah. a trick. What if I get... <laughs> <laughs> it's a trick. It's a trap. <laughs> it's get a trap. Getting off the plane and there's Italian writing everywhere. Hang on a minute. It's not Korea. <laughs> oh, Roll. God, it's happened again. <laughs> so, should we play a tune? Yes, let's play a tune. Is it... Uh, let me guess what one you're going to go All right, for I'm going to play... I'm going to play... A song by a guy called James Ray. This is again from the 60s. You'll recognise this. It was a big hit in the 80s for one of the Beatles. This is called... Ah, I didn't know that was a cover. Neither did I. This is called I've Got My Mind Set On You by James Ray. Ah, I'm amazed. Do you reckon to that? I didn't know that was a cover. No, me neither till a few years ago. I was just flicking through some stuff on iTunes and... I got it was on a compilation album and I thought surely it can't be the same song but there it was unbelievable I kind of prefer it to George's version yeah uh. I do as well did I met George once go on uh, um <laughs> 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 well I know that you met him because we've previously spoke about it. I was trying to be professional and all I could master was go on it's a great it's a great showbiz story I was at a bonfire at Chris Lord's house from Deep Purple in the 90s. And because uh, I knew his daughter, Sarah, Sarah right. Lord. And uh, there's this huge bonfire and loads of people there and all that. And uh, Chris, uh, Chris L uh, John Lord's house backed on to Friar Park where George lives. And one of them saying, Oh, George will be along later on. I was like, No, wait, we were George, George. And it was, uh, it was the big beard. The denim mm. jacket. And uh, I remember we sat around the bonfire and he sat down beside me and he said, uh, do you want to share a Heineken? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, go ahead. And we had a, like two cans of Heineken. And uh, he's like, do you like Carl Perkins? <laughs> and I said, no. And it's like, do you like Chuck Berry? And uh, we talked about guitars for uh, ages and he was a, he was a proper dude. Loved him. What yeah. year? What? So in the 90s? That so. would have been 96. 96 or 7. And I I know that because it's when I'd, re I'd gotten my first Rolls Royce ah. from uh, Alan McGee in the winter of 96. So it must have been the summer of 97, actually. The Rolls Royce you've never driven? Never driven it, no. I have been driven in it. It's still in a garage somewhere. It nearly got sold once. I stuck it on. Uh, somebody tried to. Somebody tried to buy it, and uh, when we went to get the money, some lad had bid on it with his dad's credit card, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, couldn't get the money. So that, I think I think he's still in a garage somewhere. So is that the only time you met George Harrison? Yeah, yeah. Wow. It was, uh, yeah, I met him and Ringo, of course, and yeah, Macca. Yeah, it's amazing when you meet him because. Although you like you you'll be talking to them right, and mm. they're just normal, obviously extraordinary thing that they did, but they're like normal guys. And then it's not until you've been the news agents a couple of weeks after, and they'll be on the cover of Mojo where you go, no way, man, that's one of the Beatles, one of the Beatles, incredible. But um, James Ray got my mind set on you. Was not even aware that, that was a cover version, but um, 
staggering version, I think. Well, when that came out, that was like in the 80s, wasn't it? Because I was a yeah. kid when that came out. But like, I suppose then you wouldn't have gone, oh, that's a cover version. It was just a pop song. Yeah, but song, we see music it? for it. We, we perceived music differently then, didn't we? It was yeah. not like you didn't, you, you, I didn't want to find out about anything. It was just on top of the pops yeah. and it was great. And I wasn't even that interested in who George Harrison was, apart from the fact that he was in. Yeah. Because he had another single after that called When We Was Fab. Remember that? Right, yeah. And he was like dressed in all Sergeant Pepper gear in the video. But he was involved in like with Nan and I and the Monty Python films. Yeah, yeah, he was. So like had he had, made, I think he had made films. He financed it, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. He turned up to the set. I remember reading because you know, I love yeah. that film. He's in. He's done a lot. He financed the Ruttles as well, didn't he? He's in the Ruttles, as a matter of fact. Is he? Yeah. One of my favourite ever films, the Ruttles. Yours? I've never seen it. What? I've never seen oh, it. Oh, you'd love it. Have you never seen it? No. Oh, we've, you've got to come around to mine and watch it together one night. Really? Is it as good as Spinal Tap? Oh, it's way better. Really? Yeah. All right. Well, it's it's Eric Idle and all, the Monty Python lot doing a, a spoof of the Beatles story. Yeah, I've never watched it. It's a, The manager's called Leggy Mountbatten. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got one false leg. And he's kind of... And it's brilliant. It's brilliant, brilliant. Really? Yeah. And, um, oh, it's brilliant. The album's brilliant as well. Great film, great film. Um, so this is Radio X, you're listening to Noel Gallagher with Matt Morgan. Um, and we're going to do another question from Yous. Uh, let me grab my headphones. This, uh, I think this is Daniel, number 13. Daniel. Hi Noel, I'm Daniel. So do you have plans for a new album to hide from birds with your new songs? It's been four years since you released The Man Who Built The Moon. If you allowed me, I would suggest the name of the next album. It's looking for a new path. Thanks, bye. What did he say? What was that? That wasn't a question. He said, when do you plan on releasing a new High Flying Birds album? It's been four years. Can I suggest the title? He was actually more forceful than that. Yeah. And he said, it's called, it is called Taking a New Path or something like that. Yeah. All right, Daniel. <coughs> so, <laughs> first things first, mate. I'm not short of a title. Okay. Um, has it been four years? Yeah, well, yeah. The ne my next album is penciled in for 2023 right and i'd penciled that in before the pandemic because i'd got back off tour 2019 i was was, was gonna have 2020 off uh this year was writing which i'm i've written eight new songs this year you've heard some of them matthew very good yeah yeah how uh, many do you I, need for an album uh probably about 16, 17 to so you know, let's write 10, then put them out because you, yeah, you need about 16, 17. Um, so I'm halfway through it. Uh, and so this next year will be recording, and then 2023 will be putting it out because by then, live music, uh, rhythm and routine to it all, it's all a bit up in the air at the minute, isn't it? Mm. And um, people actually, until they go and see a live gig, won't realize what they've missed until they, until they get it back, yeah. I've done I've done a gig recently, but it was for TV, and even the rehearsing of it with the other people was it's an amazing gives you an amazing lift to your your being. But I was at um, Sonny, my son, his school concert the other night. He did his first gig, and he, did I show you the video? Yeah, must have made a video. Yeah, and uh, he did. Uh, so there's a procession of angsty kind of it's, it's all all ages. He's ten, so he's. <clears throat> Angsty teenager singing "Creep" by Radiohead. Mm. Um, what the hell am I doing here? What the hell are you doing here? This private school? And it's because your dad's a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're doing here, okay? And you're here to follow in his footsteps. And uh, introspective girls doing Amy Winehouse, and uh, you know, free and easy chaps doing uh, uptown funk. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and all the acts were like, I'd say on average, all of them had eight or nine people on stage multiple guitarists and I was thinking well I'll wait till Sonny gets on Sonny gets on three of them power trio is the only one playing the guitar I got a little knot in my stomach because I was like why well, he's only 10 do you know what I mean he's not been playing that long he's not even been interested in it that long and uh, there was a little thing uh, like a projected thing of who it was and what they were going to play it came up, 20th Century Boy, T-Rex. I was like, get in there, son. And he had it. He had it down. He had the riff. 
and he played a blinder and he even did a little at the end and I was really never good. been so proud of anything or anyone really? in my life yeah Aww. it was great it was amazing and uh, his mate George Watson on the drums George the timekeeper uh, was brilliant uh, I was a four I mean, I I, Gigi was on key yeah the four of them but um, absolutely brilliant the but Sonny's is, timing is brilliant was, is like it metronomic bang yeah bang on yeah and uh but I was very, very proud. Um, he sent me the video and I replied rather wittily, uh, I see ripping off T-Rex is genetic. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that is good. This is, the, this is my life, is me like getting excited about things and him going, eh, so I see it runs in the family, does it? <laughs> Stepping on dead people's copyright. <laughs> I'm like, all right, the lad's 10, you know what I mean? No, it was. I was impressed when I first watched it. I was watching the singer. I thought, bloody hell, his hair's grown. He's got taller. <laughs> yeah, and then, then you see little Sonny at the back. Yeah. You know, but he's Aww. but he's virtually the same size as his guitar, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. But hang great. on. So in the past, I've said, why don't you teach your boys guitar? And you've said, oh, they're not interested. So how did that come no, about? Because it's going, it's going to plan. My plan was always not to say, right, Dad's a musician. You're going to be a musician, because. I know loads of kids who've done that, and by the time they get to 21, they've given it up. They're, right, just, yeah. they're just not interested. So my plan was just to leave musical instruments around the house. And um, Sonny's always had little like keyboards in his room and, and a guitar. Sadly, Donovan tripped over a guitar on the stairs. And <laughs> <laughs> Donovan's more interested in girls, which, I mean, why wouldn't you be? Yeah. Um, but Sonny is, uh, yeah, he literally picked it up and he's had a go and he's he's into it. So you didn't know he was going to do T-Rex? Well, he was practising a few things. He was like, the obligatory smoke on the water. And then he came home one night and he said, can you play Thunderstruck by ACDC? And I was like, sheepishly went, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, oh, guy in our school can play. He's grade two. What grade are you? I was like, I'm grade 76 million, son. That's what I am. How about that? Um... But, uh, yeah, big up Sonny. He's made me very, very He's proud, good, Dad. He's yeah. very good. Right, so we play a tune because we... Um, I'm going to play a track by Stephen Stills. You know who Stephen Stills is? No, nope, never heard of him. Have you ever heard of Crosby, Stills, Nash? Oh, you know? yeah. Well, he's oh, the Stills. Oh, he's the Stills. This is a brilliant song called Love the One You With. You will have heard this, but you don't know Stephen Stills, but this is Love the One You With by Stephen Stills. This is Radio X. You're listening to I, Noel Gallagher, and him over there, Matt Morgan. Um, so we're going to take another question from yeah. y'all. Uh, so who's this character? Hello, ho, the mighty Noel. I like to know, what do you think of Yoko Ono? She's a bit mental, isn't she? Bit of a bam pot. <laughs> <laughs> a bam pot. <laughs> uh, she sent me a package recently, actually. Yoko. Yeah. Uh, and it arrived at the door. It was a, it was a gold box. Uh, and I immediately knew it was from Yoko Ono because it had a big sticker on the front that said, from Yoko Ono. Cool. Well, it actually said from, Yoko, it actually said from Yoko and Sean. Um, That's weird that you'd send that through the post. I suppose it got delivered properly. But you'd think someone might see that. Do you know what I mean? It should be a bit more annoying. I think it was record. I think it was like recorded delivery, but um, I've met Yoko on a couple, a couple of occasions, and she's a very, very lovely lady. But she's uh, as an artist, she's quite far out. What does she like? What do you? Well, how does the John Lennon conversation? Uh, I never go? spoke to her about John Lennon. As a matter of fact, I met her once in a restaurant in New York, and uh, I'm to be sat at a table. She was there. And I met her. Did you, at a, did you speak first to her? Uh, yeah, because I'd met her at an award ceremony, right? Uh, maybe a couple of years before, and sat down and had a chat with her. I don't think I ever spoke about John. Um, I imagine she gets a bit sick of that, wouldn't you? Mm. She's got a bit of a. She's got a bit of a, an aura about her, actually. Mm. Yeah. Well, he must have seen something in her. Well, I think she, I think she I think she released him artistically, didn't she? I think yeah. she validated it. Is is. Uh, I'm going to use the word crazy, not that he was mad or crazy, but he, he was like, I think he wanted to get a bit far out and uh, Paul was not far out and neither was Cynthia. So right. they were his two main partners. So I think she opened the door. 
Do you think she's like unfairly maligned? Yes. Yoko. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's you know the the Yoko broke up the Beatles thing. That's kind of it's the kind of thing that would happen now on social media, isn't it? Mm. You know. Um, but yeah, as if like an outside entity could break up that band. But it, I guess at the time the press had to blame somebody. They couldn't blame Paul. Couldn't blame John. You know. So Paul uh, never like blamed her, did he? I've never heard any of the Beatles blaming her. No. I think I think the fact that Yoko was with John all the time, even while recording, that was a divisive act because she was the only outsider in when the four of them were there she was with him and that was divisive as an as a as an act but i don't the no one's a, i don't you don't really hear any of them bad mouthing her it must have been weird though like imagine you know well yeah you... kind of well being in a having been in a band you know when all your birds turn up anyway all of them it's a bit it's a it's a weird thing because you're in a little boys club you know and um when the when the wags turn up um <laughs> it's a it's a different it's a different all the boys act differently you know what yeah. i mean um so i would imagine back then and the beatles and all that would have been as weird yeah yeah cuz you think like that that's a sort of um a partnership him and paul especially mm. but like and then it's weird that John didn't think, hang on, this is a bit mad because we've never had this before. I think it was... like a a, a confrontational, aggressive gesture. Mm. Like, she's with me, what are you going to do about it? Kind of thing. Yeah. I think, I think, I think, I think they were, I think, from the books that I've read, they were, they were on the road on a slippery slope they they kind of all drifted apart which bands do you know what i mean you kind yeah. of you're in a band when you're in your 20s and you and you're all in the back of a van and then all and then all of a sudden you're in your 40s and you've got kids <clears throat> and you're not really you know you're not really the guy that joined the band so it's it's not on, it's not it's not an uncommon thing um but yeah she was unfairly maligned for the for the breakup of the beatles she's an she was an easy target you know, she was a Japanese woman, you know what I mean? Mm. And the press in this country are pretty racist anyway, and they always have been, you know what I mean? So they kind of, they offered her up as it was her fault, you know, and, uh, yeah, fans took the bait kind of thing. But uh, from my own experiences, lovely lady. The cap is doffed. She was there, you know what I mean? Mm. She was there. She was there, so she's a, she's a lovely lady. Okay. Have you ever have you ever heard uh, any of her tunes? Um, no, I just re- was aware of her like wailing in the background of things. Have you seen any of her art? Yeah, I, I saw the the thing where you go up a ladder and there's a tiny little thing yeah. like that sort of sixties yeah. pop art. It's not really pop art, but like yeah, yeah, co- conceptual art. Let me call it. Yeah, yeah. I think she's cool actually. And uh, what was in the box? What box? Oh, oh, it was. Um, Oh, a plastic Ono band reissue load of merch box, uh, box set kind of thing. Right. Yeah, because I'd um, I'd done I'd done something for Sean on the day of John's 80th birthday, and it was a like thank you very much for that kind of ah, vibe. That um, was beautiful. That was yeah, and I don't even know how she got my address. This is the weird thing because I obviously I've never I've never given her my address or Sean, and uh, yeah, it just arrived at the house. So. Maybe what they just it? said was it just said Noel Gallagher London. What did you do? Was it jealous guy? Uh, Mind games. Uh, I did. A, well, they wanted me to get involved with this album, and I couldn't get involved with it because I was doing something at the time. And on the eve of his birthday, Sean said, "Oh, you know, it's Dad's birthday tomorrow, and can you do something on your socials?" I happened to be in the studio, and I said, "Well, let's record. We'll we'll." Just did a version of Mind Games and did a little film of that. And, uh, yeah. Is that ever coming out? That yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll finish that. it off and do it for. Uh, I'll do it for Record Store Day, maybe or something. I did a lot of covers recently. I'll probably collect. I collect them all and 
do it for some or other. But yeah. um, it came out pretty good, actually. It was, it was really good. Pretty good. We have a question from Go one on. of our yeah. lovely listeners. What song would you steal from another band and claim that you wrote if you could? Bye-bye. <laughs> Who was that? What did it even leave a name? Anonymous. Not that. What song would you steal from another? What song would I steal from another band and claim it was mine? He's done that, hasn't he? I mean, has he not heard any of my tunes or what? <laughs> yeah. It's a regular thing. What's the percentage change it has to go through to not be? Is there a uh, sort of? It depends what you're nicking. If you're if you're if you're stealing something that then becomes the song. Mm. For example, the bittersweet symphony riff yeah that becomes the song then i'm afraid you're not getting any pocket money out of that but um i don't you know chord progressions i don't think are above the copyright uh the copyright laws i think i don't think you can copyright a chord progression um lyrics you won't get away with that you won't get away with uh riffs you've got to be clever you say that, but you have been sued quite a few times. I've been sued once. What for? Twice. Twice. And one. And the second time, I offered it up, and said, "Look, guys, I don't know why I've done it. I've stolen your song." <laughs> it was from Stevie Wonder, actually. That was and, it. Uh, yeah, but I've got a song credited to Wonder Gallagher. So, wow. Yeah. Good name for a child. If you were going to have another one. Uh, if I was going to have another child, I'd probably. I don't know if it was a a little lad. I don't fancy Genghis. <laughs> Genghis Gallagher. Genghis Gallagher, no? Yeah. Why not? Have you got any kids, Neil? Yeah. How many? I've got a daughter. You've got a daughter? Just one. What's her name? Anouk. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not so you, your ex missus chose it. So you're not with your missus no. now. Right. Let that yeah. be a lesson to you. <laughs> Um, got something in common, new term, you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a nuke. What about you if you had another child? What would you call I it? I always wanted, and Katie was very firm in not letting this happen. Well, actually, she didn't produce twins, so she wouldn't have let it happen. But I wanted twin girls called Paige and Iomi, like Jimmy Page and Tony Iomi for Black Sabbath. Apparently, that was schoolboyish and stupid. It is stupid. It's not. You should have called... Well, you know this. Your your first child should have been called Gunton, as you well know. Morgan. Yeah, and then the second one should have been called Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, I'll take on your suggestions for next time. So if it let's happens. get the question: Was what song would I steal? And then it must be a song. Yeah, you, you go. Oh, I wish I'd written that. That's what you. Oh sort God, of there's asking. there's fifteen of them here. But recently, <laughs> recently. Uh, if I could have written, I w maybe get up by Young Fathers. But that's got a kind of a little bit of a rap in the middle, so that's not going to work. You could do it. That I could get away with a rap. I think so. Do you think so? I think so. If you were, uh, I mean, I could see you in the video, backwards baseball cap, just just doing a little bit of a bob side to side. Doing Mate, it. some of my fans had a nervous breakdown when there was French girls in the band, so I'm not sure rapping is going to go down too well with my fan base. Push the envelope. I pushed it. They did not like it. Would you ever consider rap? If you wrote a song and you thought, that, do you know what that needs? Is a little fast... We rap. Put a, David Holmes said that to me once <laughs> when we were doing Fort Knox. So what we're going to do in this bit? Put a wee rap on it. <laughs> oh, like a Robbie Williams sort of like... I know, he was talking about getting Kanye in to do it. Um, no, I struggle with lyrics for the best of times. Phallus trying to make something rhyme and be cool for the mm. kids, do you know what I mean? Rapping, it's not for me. It's not for me. You mind if I could get you to write my raps? I'm quite good at writing the old rhyming Well, you're lyrics. good with... See, I'll, I send him videos all the time and he and he, he'll, he all sends back an annoying little catchphrase that's got something to do with the video. And it's kind of like, like <laughs> he's like some mad... I like to give something back. ...kids entertainer, you know what I mean? It's really... You just wait for the ding and go, yeah, whatever. He, he does a little yeah. emoji of rolling eyes, like... <laughs> <laughs> it's my favourite one. It is a good one. It is a good one. Passive-aggressive emoji. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Uh, but no, there's not. There's not. There's lots of songs that I wish I'd written. She bangs the drums. I wish I'd written that. But then again, I can't really complain about that as I've written more than enough. Mm. I think. Let's do one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. I think. Mm. We should do a question from the yes, darling from, listeners. From the darling listeners, yes. Yes. Uh, let's have Josh. Hi, Noel. So, first of all, congrats on the number one album. Thank you. The best of. Thank um, you. My question is, it is now 10 years of the High Flying Birds, and in that time you've built up uh, quite a bit of a back catalogue, and you've even said yourself that uh, during recent live gigs, uh, the Oasis numbers are becoming less and less uh, in terms of the makeup of the set list. Uh, do you ever envisage yourself performing a gig that is just made up of high flying bird songs, so no wasted songs at all, or is it a case that those songs will always be a part of your live sets? Well, Josh sounds like he's got a cold for a start, or he's got COVID. One of the two. Um. So, Josh, yes. Now, the thing is, is, you have to strike a balance because I don't think I could see myself doing a, like a special gig of all Oasis songs, which I've done for for the teenage cancer trust i could see that but i'm not sure i could go out on tour i'm not sure i'd want to do a full set of high flying bird songs because there's always going to be someone there who's seeing you for the first time who's going to be a huge oasis fan and if you don't do don't look back in anger and half the world away and wonderwall I'd have thought they'd probably feel a bit short changed. It's like if I went to see McCartney mm. and he didn't do any beat or songs, you'd be like, Well, come on, mate. You know what I mean? So I don't I don't see that happening at an I Flying Birds gig. And it, and t it's not like these Oasis songs are just like run of the mill songs. These are like a part of the furniture, do you know what I mean? And they they elicit an amazing reaction and response from people. So I don't really see a day when I, I just do all High Flying Birds songs, unless I was to announce it pretty far up front and say it was just going to be that. But um, I guess I'd know then how popular the band was. <laughs> <laughs> You'd see them, wouldn't you? You know what I mean? But um, no, I don't see that day, Josh. But uh, there you go. So I think we've reached the end. Yeah. I feel um, like we've talked about a lot of stuff. We've covered a lot of ground. We have, uh, we've stopped for food. I've had a lovely lettuce wrap. It's something that I was never aware of, which was a hamburger, not wrapped in, uh, not in a bun, in between two pieces of lettuce. Yeah, and you enjoyed it. I did enjoy it, actually. I introduced you to that. Yeah. I did, that was good, that was good. Good. We Lighter. found out that uh, Neil uh, has a daughter by the name of Anouk. We found out that... Matt's got some ridiculous tattoos. Yep. What else did what else? What else revealed itself? Uh, in 2025, you're going to sell all the rights to Oasis Music and buy a super yacht called Mega Mega White Thing, on which you're going to have a tattoo all over your back of Man City. That's correct. And then you're going to sail the globe for a year, if it is a globe. I don't want. I know there's some people out there who don't believe it what, is flat Earth idiots, flat Earth people. Nonsense. Don't want to offend them. No. Uh, well, let's offend them. I mean, it's a nonsense. It's a. They're not. I mean, what? Come on. Yeah. I know. It is nonsense. Of course, it's nonsense. You. Oh, we didn't even bring the aliens up, did we? You got away, there, didn't you? Scot free. I don't want to talk about them anymore. No, of course you don't, because you're embarrassed After by your own view to me. Well, anyway, boys and girls, that was Radio X. I was and shall remain for the foreseeable future. Noel Gallagher. That was Matt Morgan, Neil Fern. I'm going to leave you with a tune by the Headless Heroes called True Love Will Find You. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for all your support. It's on behalf of the group. I will thank you on behalf of them too. Um, the future is looking great for the High Flying Birds. Thanks to you guys. Thanks for sticking with us on this musical journey. We shall see you somewhere down the road. These are the Headless Heroes. Good night. Good night. Radio X.